Now, let's talk about the means at your disposal to prosecute, because I was fascinated by how hard it is to bring these cases in Jordan. Um, you, you're talking about the criminal prosecutor? Yeah. Well, and in the beginning, the criminal prosecutors did not pay much attention to these crimes because usually what happens is the the, the defendant or the suspect uh, kills his sister and then goes and turns himself into police claiming to have cleansed his family's honor and hand in the weapon. So to most, to the authorities, it's, it's a conf uh, self-confessed murder. They mm -hmm. don't need to investigate it that much. And at that time, they considered, you know, that these women deserve to die. They probably did something wrong. Uh, of course, after all the activism we did in Jordan and then the training of judges and criminal prosecutors, now the attitude changed. They're becoming to take uh, the killing of women more seriously. Uh, they're, the, you know, when they prepare the indictment, they, they charge them with very the highest uh, charge. And even the judges were seeing a change in attitude. I mean, before, uh, the killers used to get three months, six months, one year for taking a woman's life. Mm -hmm. You can write a bad check and get uh, a higher sentence than, than this. And this was something else that I also focused on uh, in my work. But now we, we see a change even in the attitudes of the judges. They're starting to pass on harder sentences. They're not taking, uh, you know, the killer's story because a lot of times it's premeditated. And then when they go to court, they try to claim it was a moment of rage and that it was they committed it just when they saw their sister. So, I mean, things are really improving in Jordan. Mm. And it's a, it's a positive sign, I think. What about what are Articles 340 and... and Article 340 talks about uh, uh, if a man uh, walk, uh, is surprised by his uh, wife or any of his female relative committing adultery with another man, kills or injures one or both, he benefits from a reduction in penalty. A second uh, article uh, talks about if a woman w uh, is surprised by her husband committing uh, adultery with another woman on their ma in their house and kills one or both, she benefits from a reduction. Now, this article is not really applied that much in court. What's usually applied is Article 98, which talks about any person who kills another person because of uh, an unlawful and dangerous act on the part of the, uh, of the defendant, uh, then uh, he benefits from a reduction in penalty as well. Meaning, uh, if, if, the, if, the center, if the charge is premeditated, it becomes misdemeanor. Uh, and many of the killers were getting away with this, uh, with this mm -hmm. article because the courts uh, considered sometimes the woman's behavior or, you know, if she's pregnant or whatever, or she goes missing, an unlawful and dangerous uh, act. And the status of those articles now? They're still in, uh, in force. Uh, they're trying now to change Article 98. We're not sure how it will go, but I think, uh, I think changing the law alone is not going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You have to work on it from all its aspects. Well, one of the... Uh, Evidences of that is that these practices continue around the world as, as populations shift. Talk about the situation in a country like this one where we don't have the legal challenges. It should be easy to prosecute, and yet you still hear about these horrific stories like the story in Texas and the story mm. in Phoenix. Yeah, well, as you said, you know, these crimes uh, happen all over the world. Killing of women is, uh, is an international phenomenon. It's not something restricted to any culture or society or religion. Uh, when we talk about it here in the U.S., I don't think that it's too, the issue is really uh, very strong as it is in Europe. I mean, in Europe, they tackled it uh, in a very expanded manner. They started to pay more attention to women in their migrant communities, provide them with services. In courts, uh, the courts are now rejecting any cultural excuse that the families might uh, put forward to, to try to acquit the person who committed the murder. Here, there was one incident recently where a family was under surveillance mm -hmm. um, for suspicion of terrorism. You write about that yes, case. Yes. And there actually is a transcript of the daughter's call to 911, yeah. to the security forces. Did that provoke a it reaction? Was, uh, it, was the, it was a transcript of uh, the, the dialogue between them. It was, uh, yeah, the, the father and the mother and the daughter and how they killed her. Unfortunately for her, uh, she was unlucky because no one was listening to the tapes. Otherwise, they would have saved her. This was a really sad story. Uh, it happened in the late 80s, I think, or early 90s. I can't remember now. But uh, this, this one drew a lot of attention, and then the issue died. Mm. Um, so uh, here in the U.S., I don't, I, I don't see uh, that there's a lot of strong work to work with immigrants or uh, the justice system being tolerant toward these uh, murders still. But I think by time and by raising awareness, uh, these things will be taken more seriously. What's your advice to feminists here who live within the United States and have seen 
our president, most recently George W. Bush, use uh, Arab practices against women as an argument to invade Arab Persian countries. We were told we were liberating women mm. when U.S. forces went to Iraq. What's your advice? Because I think that that leads a lot of women to be confused about how to address real crimes um, happening under communities that are also stereotyped and manipulated. Well, yeah, I guess it's unfortunate that uh, women and children's issues are always politicized. And uh, in this manner, they were politicized to sort of uh, try to convince be people to accept uh, waging wars on Afghanistan, on Iraq, on, uh, uh, you know, on countries. And this is really bad because uh, in Iraq, women were, <laughs> they had more freedom before uh, the U.S. came. Now they have, they're passing laws that is really restricting their freedom. In Afghanistan, if you see, I mean, you don't see anything positive happening to women there. So basically, it's unfortunate that this argument is being used. And I think people need to be more uh, aware and careful and, uh, you know, to do research and, uh, uh, if, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, we, Maybe we the try. answer to these crimes in your work is to help you not send troops. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's uh, it's really sad. And uh, people in our uh, part of the world are really frustrated by this uh, because uh, people are not uh, stupid. And they know that uh, this issue is always used uh, to justify things. And it's unfortunate that, that even, w even when they do it, they're not improving anyone's life. Doesn't make it not an issue, though. What can people do to help you? I think people can, uh, should, I think women, if, uh, women groups here and feminists and uh, human rights activists in general and groups should uh, constantly address the issue of so-called honor crimes and domestic violence in a global manner. Mm. And it should be a continuous d uh, discussion. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, decide that you want to focus on it for two or three months and then let it go. This is a global issue. Consistency that needs to and be. spectrum. Thank you so much. Rana Husseini, great book, Murder in the Name of Honor, the true story of one woman's heroic fight against an unbelievable crime. Just out now from One World Press. There's more information at our website, grittv.org. <laughs>